Yeah, hello everybody. So this is the podcast version of the mRNA processing lecture from the Level 3 module Medical Genetics, delivered at the University of Bradford. So the learning outcomes for this lecture, um, well there's only two but they're relatively complex. The first is that you need to be able to, at the end of the lecture, critically discuss the mechanisms that the cell uses to regulate the processing and transport of mRNA. And as you're going to see over the next 50 minutes or so, there are several quite complex mechanisms which the cell utilises in order to achieve this. You also need to be able to describe in some detail how errors in these processing mechanisms um, lead directly to different types of human disease. Okay, so a very basic recap then um, about what we talked about in the DNA transcription lecture. So effectively, in eukaryotic organisms such as ourselves, when gene expression occurs, what's actually happening is a large multi-protein enzyme complex called RNA polymerase, RNA polymerase 2 is recruited to the transcriptional start site of a gene via um, interactions with numerous transcription factors and other protein complexes. And once there, and given the correct signals, this RNA polymerase 2 enzyme starts copying the information in the DNA in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction to transcribe a messenger RNA copy of that information. Now once this messenger RNA has been fully transcribed, it needs to then make its way into the cytoplasm where it's eventually bound by ribosomes and translated into protein. So what we're going to be talking about today is everything that happens between that onset of transcription and up to the point where the ribosomes get hold of the mRNA and to start making it into protein. And it may be that prior to this lecture you've not really given much thought to what processes might occur between these two events. You may have just thought that well mRNA gets produced and it somehow gets out of the nucleus where it then gets made into protein. But as you're going to see there's a whole raft of modifications and mechanisms in place which need to act on the mRNA before it can get actually used to generate um, proteins in the cytoplasm. Okay, so what are these this raft, this collection of, of events then? Well, collectively they're known as post-transcriptional regulation. In other words, these are modifications which occur to the mRNA following transcription. Actually, current research shows that a lot of these events actually happen co-transcriptionally. So it's not a simple case of just a linear set of modifications, like a production line, if you like, um, that modify the mRNA. In other words, A doesn't happen to the mRNA, and then it moves on a little bit down the conveyor belt, and B happens. These things are often happening kind of at the same time, which makes them even more complex to study experimentally. From the point of view of trying to understand these processes, it's probably more useful for you to try and view them as sequential events. And certainly that's how the wider scientific community viewed them up until just a few years ago. So if we look at the major events then in the life of an mRNA molecule. So when an mRNA molecule is born or it's initially transcribed, the first thing that really happens to it is it's processed. We'll talk more about that in a second. Once processing is complete of the mRNA, then it undergoes splicing to remove the non-coding intronic material. Now we're going to spend quite a lot of time on splicing today because it's one, it's a very complex process, and two, it's incredibly important for the generation of complex organisms, which we've touched on before at level one and at level two in related modules. Once we've discussed splicing, we'll move on to nuclear export of the mRNA. So you should realise by now that in humans, in eukaryotic cells, mRNA is made in the nucleus, but it is translated in the cytoplasm. So before you can use the mRNA to make protein, you need to get the mRNA out of the nucleus. That just doesn't happen passively, it's a directed process and one that's quite complex, as we'll discuss. And then finally, towards the end of the life of an mRNA, it's translated in the cytoplasm by ribosomes and ultimately degraded. Uh, we're not going to discuss about translation and degradation too much in this lecture. They're going to be more in the actual uh, lecture that we're going to finish with. Um, uh, the finish this section of lectures with, which is going to discuss translational regulation of gene expression. The point is that each of these events that we're talking about here offers the cell an opportunity to fine-tune gene expression. So at any of these five points, the cell can decide to act in such a way that gene expression is subtly modified. It's particularly 
true that gene expression is fine-tuned at the point of splicing and at the point of translation and degradation. So let's consider what we've got then, what the cell has once it's finished transcription. So you've just had electron transcription previous to this lecture where we talked about RNA polymerase 2, moving along the gene and copying mRNA, etc. Um, so let's consider what the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme has actually produced. Well, it's produced what is known as a precursor mRNA or a pre-mRNA molecule. And the, this cartoon here kind of shows you a picture of what that looks like. Effectively, what the RNA polymerase enzyme does is it binds just upstream of the actual start codon and starts transcribing the information in the gene until such a point that it reaches a termination region where, if you recall, the torpedo model then uh, causes the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme to be vaulted off of the DNA and, and transcription to stop. What you're left with once transcription stops is this pre-mRNA, precursor mRNA molecule, which contains all the exons in the gene, all the introns in the gene, and importantly, this upstream and downstream untranslated region. Now, at this point, this mRNA is not much good to the translational machinery in the cytoplasm. If a ribosome was to come along and bind to this precursor mRNA, it wouldn't be able to distinguish between the coding regions and the non-coding regions. And what you will produce is a huge protein that effectively wouldn't work because the sequence would be wrong. So before the ribosomes get hold of this mRNA, the cell needs to process it in such a way that all that's left pretty much at the end of the processing events are the coding sequence that the ribosome is going to read and make into protein. So those processing events involve the removal of the non-coding intronic information, predominantly by the splicing machinery, but also other modifications to the mRNA as well to assist it in its journey to the cytoplasm and to also ensure that it's not degraded before the ribosomes can actually bind to it and translate the information it contains into protein. This includes a 5' prime cap and this 3' prime poly A tail region here. So once you have spliced the introns out, added these two structures to the mRNA, you then have what is known as a mature mRNA molecule. And this molecule then is ready to be exported to the cytoplasm and translated into protein. So let's consider the first processing events then, number one on that list that I gave you a couple of slides ago. So the first thing that actually happens to an mRNA, pretty much as it's actually been transcribed by poly, uh, RNA polymerase 2, is that it's capped at, at, at the 5' prime end of the emerging mRNA molecule. And the cap is a very specialised structure. It's what's known as a 7-methylguanosine cap. Bit of a mouthful, I appreciate. But it, this, this terminology refers to the chemistry of the actual guanosine, guanosine um, residue that's been placed on the 5' prime end of the mRNA. So the actual addition of this 7-methylguanosine cap utilises quite an unusual 5' prime to 5' prime triphosphate bridge. And this bridge, this linkage, is established by the action of the so-called capping enzyme complex, the CEC complex. Now the CEC complex at the start of transcription is actually associated with the C-terminal domain of RNA polymerase 2. Remember the C-terminal domain is this long regulatory region of the polymerase. And what happens is, at the start of transcription, as soon as the new mRNA begins to emerge from the exit pore of RNA polymerase 2, this capping enzyme complex is transferred from the C-terminal domain of RNA polymerase 2 onto the emerging mRNA, at which point it places this 7 methyl guanosine cap on the 5' prime end of the emerging mRNA molecule by virtue of this 5' prime to 5' prime triphosphate bridge. Once this has happened, the capping enzyme complex dissociates from the 5' prime cap and is replaced by a second complex called the cap binding complex. Now the cap binding complex is made up of different proteins. It's made up of two proteins called CBC20 and CBC80, cap binding complex 20 and 80. And these two proteins are very important because they're required for the successful nuclear export of the mRNA into the cytoplasm and also for the protection of the mRNA from endonucleases which would otherwise degrade it before it ever made it that far. Okay, so once capping's complete, 
what actually happens towards the end of transcription, but we'll deal with it now because it makes more sense, is that the mRNA is modified by the addition of a poly A tail. So the poly A tail refers to around 200 adenine residues, A's, that are added to the end of the mRNA. So how does this work? Well, it works in a similar way in some respects of the cap, insofar that two proteins are associated with the C-terminal domain of the RNA polymerase 2. These two proteins, which are the cleavage and polyadenylation specificity factor, or CPSF, and the cleavage stimulation factor, or CSTF, are associated with this C-terminal domain and remain so until the RNA polymerase enzyme passes this poly A signal sequence, which is present in the DNA. So once RNA pol 2 passes this poly A signal, these two proteins, CPSF and CSTF, are transferred from the poly A tail to the emerging mRNA molecule. And they're transferred from the poly A tail to the copied poly A signal sequence that's now also present in the RNA. So RNA polymerase 2 goes past the poly A signal, obviously copies it during transcription, and then once that's done, these two proteins transfer from the C-terminal domain of RNA polymerase 2 to the newly transcribed poly A signal that's present in the mRNA molecule. What happens then is that the cleavage stimulation factor is released and uh, following its function, so start, so start again. What happens then is that the cleavage stimulation factor leads to the cleavage of the mRNA just after this poly A signal. So this um, remaining mRNA following the poly A signal is lost, it's not required. Once it's done that, the CSTF factor is dissociated from the mRNA, just leaving the CPSF factor bound to the poly A signal. And at that point, a third protein, poly A polymerase, is recruited to the mRNA molecule. Poly A polymerase, as you might guess, in association with some stability factors such as PAB2, then goes about the business of polyadenylating the actual mRNA molecule, adding lots and lots and lots of adenine residues. These adenine residues are then rapidly bound by PAB2, which further stabilises this tail region of the mRNA. And poly A polymerase adds different numbers of adenines to different RNAs, but in general it normally adds around 200 to stabilise the mRNA transcript. Now alternative polyadenylation, as I've just mentioned, does occur on different RNAs and this is an important regulatory mechanism because it can have direct implications on uh, micro RNA based degradation of the mRNA which we're going to talk about in translational control next lecture. So the, the concept that you can have polyadenylation of different lengths and also actually polyadenylation starting at different points towards the end of a gene depending on the presence of alternative poly A signals means that you can get very different looking three prime ends to mRNAs that have been produced from the same gene. And these different looking three prime ends can lead to those proteins that are prevent sorry, can lead to those mRNAs functioning in a very different way with regards to protein production. We'll talk more about how that works with when we discuss microRNAs in the next lecture. So what I want to discuss now is the process of splicing. So we've touched upon this at level one in human genetics, and we mentioned it briefly again uh, last year when we did the molecular genetics lectures, but I'm going to go into some more detail this year about how splicing actually works. And this is relatively complex, so you might need to engage with some of the wider reading to fully get your head around this. This um, lecture is based... In, in part upon the chapter in um, chapters in the molecular biology of the gene a recommended textbook which again is an excellent textbook for carrying out some wider reading it goes into a lot more detail in these things than I've got time to do in the lecture so I really recommend you engage with that material so splicing then so what we effectively have at the end of transcription is this pre mRNA molecule that I've tried to crudely depict here in this cartoon and the mRNA is composed of these exonic regions these colored bars um, and these are the parts of the mRNA that contain coding sequence, and then this non-coding intronic region, regions, which we need to get rid of prior to uh, protein translation initiating. So what happens then is this splicing machinery comes along, recognises these non-coding regions, moves along the mRNA, removing them, 
which eventually facilitates the production of this, which is a mature mRNA molecule. So this has got no non-coding regions left, it's just got the coding sequence present. It's also got a 7-methylguanosine cap at the 5' prime end to help protect it from degradation and help it be exported to the cytoplasm. And it's also got many, many adenine residues at the 3' prime end, similarly to help it from being degraded from uh, exonucleases. And also, recent evidence shows um, that this structure is also involved in mRNA export as well. So, what's the molecular mechanism that allows this process of splicing to occur? Well, the spliceosome is the actual multi-protein complex that does the job of splicing. And I think many people would argue that it's probably the most complex macromolecular machine in the cell. So it's probably the most complex multi-protein mach machine that the cell possesses. So this is saying something if you consider things like ribosomes, which are incredibly large, complex um, multi-protein and RNA machines. And also RNA polymerase 2, which you've heard a lot about in the last lecture, is obviously a very large, very complex uh, machine but all of these things pale into significance really compared to the spliceosome which has got upwards of 400 proteins associated with it at, at the latest count it seems to go up every every month as new ones are discovered so how does this incredibly complex machine then remove intronic rna so i'm not going to talk about all three 400 proteins today obviously i'm going to talk about the core proteins that are involved in the process just so that you get a nice hopefully clear understanding of how this works the other reason is a lot of the proteins which have been shown to be associated with the spliceosome, we still really don't understand what they're doing as yet, how they're working. So what I'm going to talk to you about today, primarily, are the core components of the spliceosome, which are these U1, U2, U4, U5 and U6 SNRNPs. So these are small nuclear ribonuclear proteins. So it's very important that you realise that when I'm talking about U1, U2, U4, U5 and U6. I'm not talking about just protein here. I'm talking about protein that's interacting with RNA. So in that respect, each of these core components is similar to the ribosome, which you should by now understand is made of protein and RNA. And it's the RNA components of these small nuclear ribonuclear proteins that's key really to allowing them to function in the spliceosome. So how does it work? Well, let's just go through it briefly here and again there's an excellent chapter in the recommended textbooks that you can read at your leisure to try and get your head around this further what happens initially during splicing is this this u1 and u2 snrmp uh, and I'm, i'll mention now that often this is referred these are shortened um down to the the term snrp um so these u1 and u2 snrps bind to conserved regions within the intronic sequence that needs to be removed from the pre-mRNA molecule. So they bind to these conserved sequences within the intronic sequence by virtue of the fact that they themselves contain RNA that can form base paired interactions with the conserved sequence in the intron. So once U1 and U2 have been recruited to these conserved regions in the intronic sequence, you then get recruitment of other components of the spliceosome, including U4 and U6. U4 is important because what U4 does is it masks and prevents the catalytic activity of the U6 component. So once you have recruitment of U4 and U6 and then U5 to this burgeoning spliceosomal complex that's now all associated with the intron, you get a huge conformational change occurring. So this conformational change brings about the positioning of this adenine residue here in the intron in such a way that it can perform a nucleophilic attack on this uh, phosphodiester bond between this residue here at the very 5' prime end of the intron and the last residue at the 3' prime end of the exon. And this nucleophilic attack leads to a specific type of reaction called a transesterification reaction. And what that transesterification reaction does is it snips the RNA at this point, making a break between these two nucleotides. And when that break occurs, you then free up another OH group here, which can perform a similar nucleophilic attack and lead to a similar transesterification reaction at the other end of the intron, 
causing this phosphodiester bond to break as well. And once you've broken both of those bonds, you can eventually get a new bond forming here by the formation of a new phosphodiester bond between the two exons, which are now brought in close proximity by the splicing machinery, and the intronic material being released as, what's, uh, as a structure called a lariat. Now this lariat structure, this loop of intronic RNA, is then rapidly degraded and chewed up and the constituent parts reused in further rounds of transcription. So at the end you're left with a degraded lariat intron plus the two exon regions which have been joined together. So to, just to reiterate a couple of key points, it's sequential transesterification reactions that snip the intron at either end and then the formation of a new phosphodiester bond obviously that joins the two exons together. The intronic RNA that's removed as a lariat structure during this process is degraded. So there's a link to a video here that you can watch which does a nice job of explaining this process via an animation and that should help you understand the process a lot better than I can probably explain it on a podcast. So let's look in a bit more detail about how this is actually working then. So what we've got here is kind of a zoomed in image of um, an exon intron uh, boundary if you like. So this is the end of say exon 1 and then we have an intronic region and then we have the start of the following exon here. Now this intronic region as denoted by these slashes here could be huge, it could be several tens of thousands of nucleotides long but it could also be relatively small and we'll talk about small introns and the impact they can have on splicing later on. But let's for the time being look at this as a pretty standard example where the intron's relatively large in size. So there's a couple of key structures in this intronic sequence that you need to know about. The first is this conserved sequence here at the 5' prime splice site, particularly this uh, conserved guanine residue here, followed normally by a uracil residue. And the second thing you need to know is this so-called branch point here, so this adenine residue. Where you see A-G, that refers to consensus sequence. So what it's saying is that the consensus sequence for these regions is generally CU, and then it can be an A or a G, and then followed by an A, and then it can be a C or a U. But in all cases, it will be some combination of those nucleotides that form the branch point of an intron. Same kind of deal for this 5' prime splice site here. You also have a 3' prime splice site that's at the very end of the intron, and that's generally an adenine and a guanine residue. So how does this all fit in with the action of the splicer then? So what actually happens is U2 is recruited via RNA-RNA interactions to the branch point of the pre-mRNA molecule. And then this is closely followed by the recruitment of U1 to the 5' prime splice site of the intron by virtue again of RNA-RNA interactions between the RNA molecule that's present in the U1 SNRP and the RNA that's present in this conserved sequence in the intron. But it's a little bit more complex than that again, and I apologise, but I told you it's a complex system, this. So it's not just a case of this U1 and U2 spliceosome component being plopped down on the intron at exactly the right nucleotide in every single instance of RNA splicing, of which billions may occur across your body uh, in, over the course of just a a few minutes you know th this is a process that's continually happening during gene expression in every cell of your body yeah so we need to have a really strict control over this process and put quite simply RNA RNA based pairing is all well and good but the cell utilizes an additional level of regulation to make sure that no mistakes are made so that additional level of regulation is provided by these SR proteins the are SR proteins because these proteins are rich in serine and arginine residues, which is thought to help them bind the RNA. And what these SR proteins do is they bind to regions within the exon, which are termed exonic splicing enhancers. So let's have a look at an example here. So here we have an exon, and then an intron, and then another exon. So what actually happens is the SR proteins bind to the exonic splicing enhancers within the exon region and then buff it up to the U1 SNRP that is recruited to the 5' prime splice site here. Similarly, at the other end of the exon, the SR proteins interact with a U2 
AF protein complex, which is comprised of U2AF65 and this SC35 protein here. And what this U2AF complex does is it forms a link between the SR protein and the exon and the U2 SNRP that's been recruited to the branch point region in the intron. So in a nutshell, what these SR proteins and the U2F protein complex are doing are kind of acting as a spacer, as a linker between the U2 and U1 um, spliceosomal components and the sequence which they need to bind. So the U1 protein is actually directly recruited by the SR proteins. So there's a direct interaction there, but as I've just said, the U2 protein interacts with them via this bridging complex formed by U2AF. And together, this entire complex is known as a cross-exon recognition complex. And this is what tells the spliceosome that, look, there's an exon present here. So that mustn't be removed during splicing. It needs to be left because that's got the coding information in it that we require. If this cross-exon recognition complex is actually missing, so if you don't get this complex formed over and on top of an exon, then what happens is that when the splicing machinery assembles fully, it will simply remove the exon in addition to the intronic material because it simply won't see, inverted commas, that it's there. So that's exemplified by this cartoon here. So in the top example, we've got an exon that contains exonic splicing enhancers. This is bound by SR proteins and this has led to the correct positioning of the spliceosomal machinery over this exon. So the spliceosome knows that there's an exon present here, so it, it performs the transesterification reactions either side of the exon, and either side of these other two exons here, to remove this intronic material. Remove this intronic material. And that leaves you with this mature mRNA which contains three exons. Now let's, for example, say that the exon in this pre-mRNA doesn't contain exonic splicing enhancers, it contains these other structures called exonic splicing silencers. So what these exonic splicing silencers do is actually prevent the correct recruitment of this cross exon recognition complex. So in this example, no cross, rec uh, cross exon recognition complex is recruited on top of the exon. So when the spliceosome comes along, it recognises the exons either side of this one, causes a transesterification reaction here, a transesterification reaction here, and this entire middle section is removed, leaving you with a exon um, that is be, uh, that, sorry, leaving you with one exon missing in the final mature mRNA molecule. So it's the presence of these exonic splicing enhancers and in, on some occasions exonic splicing silencers that allow the cell or advanced cells such as human cells to undergo and perform a process called alternative splicing. So we've talked about alternative splicing at level one, we've talked about it last year at level two, this year we're going to talk about how it actually works and this is how it works. This utilisation of and loss of the cross exon recognition complex. So there's lots of different ways that alternative splicing can happen. The example I just gave you then is a very simple example where Either the exon is included or it's not included. So in the top situation here, the introns are correctly spliced and we would produce an mRNA with all three of these exons present. In the bottom example, this exon is missed out, perhaps because there have been exonic splicing silences binding to it, preventing the assembly of a cross-exon recognition complex. A slightly more complex example is this mutually exclusive exon example here. So this is where... Effectively, you have an mRNA with four exons, and it can be alternatively spliced in a mutually exclusive way to either include this exon and exclude this, or vice versa, include this exon and exclude that one. And we're going to give an example of that in a moment and explain how that actually works. There are also other, many other examples. Sometimes introns can get left in, and you can get an intronic sequence included in the final mRNA. You can get alternative splice sites within exons, so you can get the removal of an intron here as normal or you can remove a little bit of the exon in addition to the intron because of the presence of a cryptic splice site. You can get alternative promoters. So this is slightly different. This is where the actual RNA polymerase would miss an exon out because there's an alternative cryptic promoter 
in presently one of the intronic sequences. So you, in this instance, you'd lose this first exon. And you can get alternative polyadenylation sites, as I've just said. So this is where, the again, RNA polymerase 2 machinery would see an alternative poly A signal and cease termination early, producing a shorter transcript. In all of these examples, what you're doing is you're producing different protein isoforms. It's the key word, isoforms, from a single gene. Yeah? And it's this ability to produce different protein isoforms that allows us to make many proteins from just one single gene product. So in bacteria and lower systems, this is how it works. One gene makes one protein. In us and higher systems such as uh, other mammals, etc., one gene can produce many, many, many different protein isoforms. And it's this ability, this alternative splicing, that's one of the key reasons why we're able to exist as a complex organism but at the same time possess a similar number of genes to an organism that is far less complex than us, such as the nematode word C. elegans, worm C. elegans. It's also the reason why, start again, it comes at a cost obviously because with more complex systems become, you, you end up having more situations that can go wrong during the process. And we'll talk about errors in alternative splicing later on and how they impact on human disease. So let's get back to this mutually exclusive um, alternative splicing example then. Let's look at some real world examples of alternative splicing in action. So troponin T is a muscle protein, a protein involved in muscle um, function. And it's a nice example of alternative splicing. So effectively what happens with troponin T is you get a pre mRNA being produced that contains one, two, three, four, five exons. And that pre mRNA is spliced in one of two ways. It can be spliced in such a way that exon 3 is included in the final transcript. And also it can be transcribed in such a way that exon 4 can be included in the final transcript. Importantly, the inclusion of exon 3 and exon 4 are mutually exclusive. So what that means is if the mature mRNA contains exon 3, it will never contain exon 4. And vice versa, if the mature mRNA ends up containing exon 4, it will never contain exon 3. And by doing this, you effectively set up a situation where the single troponin T gene can produce two very different protein products that can perform different functions in the cell. So the question, therefore, is how does the splicing machinery ensure that if it includes exon 3 in the final transcript, it never includes exon 4, and vice versa? Well, it's a relatively simple system that actually gets used, in fact, to... Um, enable the cell to be able to do this and it involves steric hindrance which is a posh word for saying there simply isn't enough room to actually do uh, there isn't actually enough space on the mRNA to allow the proteins to do the job they need to do during splicing so let me explain what I mean by that so if we look at the situation here where we have one two three four exons and the inclusion of exon, exon three or four are mutually exclusive in this mRNA now the reason that this works is down to the actual um, size of this intronic sequence here. So because this intronic sequence is very small, what it means is that the U1 and U2 spliceosomal components simply haven't got enough room to bind to this sequence at the same time. So that leaves you with one of two possibilities occurring. The first is that the U1 protein is recruited to the 3' splice site here in exon 2. But if it is recruited, the U2 spliceosomal component then hasn't got the room to actually associate with the branch point in this same intron. Can't bind there. So what it actually ends up doing is binding in the next intron here. And this entire region, in that case, is what gets removed by the spliceosomal machinery. The transesterification reaction happens here and here to snip out this entire region, leaving you with exons 1, 2 and 4. Now the alternative situation is that U2 gets there first. It manages to bind to the branch point in this intron. But once U2 is bound to this branch point, there's no room then for U1 to get in here and bind. So what that means is that the transesterifications occur here the three prime end of this intron and here at the three prime end of this exon so you end up getting exon one included exon two is removed 
and Exxon 3 and 4 are included. So it's quite simply down to the amount of space available in this small intron. And in fact, if you look at Drosophila, we know that if an intron is less than 59 nucleotides long, it forces a situation whereby mutually exclusive splicing has to occur. For the simple reason that introns that are 58 nucleotides or smaller don't have enough room there, don't have enough room present to, to allow the occupation of both U1 and U2. So it's a relatively simple way, using steric hindrance, that alternative splicing can be regulated in, in, um, in mammalian systems. So there's a more extreme example of alternative splicing that involves this DS CAM gene uh, from Drosophila. Uh, this should be italicised, apologies. And this is a really extreme example of just how um, diverse or how many protein isoforms can be produced via alternative splicing. So the DS CAM gene from Drosophila has got the potential to generate 38,016 different protein isoforms from a single gene. And the reason it can produce so many different protein isoforms is due to the fact that four of its exons have many, many different possible, possible alternatives which can be included during the splicing process. So if we look at this image here, exon 4 has 12 possible different exon 4 sequences that can be included. Exon 6 has 48 possible exon 6s that can be included. Exon 9 has 33 possible exon 9s. And exon 17 has two different exon 17s. So what that means is when splicing occurs, the splicing machinery must pick one of these 12, one of these 48, one of these 33, and one of these two during each splicing reaction to construct this final mature mRNA molecule. And if you do the maths, if you do 12 times 48 times 33 times 2, you generate this number here, which is a possible number, total possible number of protein isoforms that this gene can actually generate. Now, I'm not going to explain how this actually works in this podcast or in the lecture. I just wanted you to be aware of it as an example. If you want to go away and try and learn how this system works, it's quite, quite complex. There's a nice little section in the Molecular Biology of the Gene core textbook that explains this, and that will be considered extra reading where you to be assessed on this question at any point. I've not got enough time in this lecture to actually go into the detail required to explain the process to you. But it's a very interesting gene, the DSCAM gene. The proteins which are produced from DSCAM, of which obviously there are many, are involved in one of two functions in the fly. The first function they're involved in is the formation of neural networks in the brain. So what the, think, what the current thinking is for DSCAM is that the different neurons that are present in the brain tend to express one of these 38,000 different DSCAM proteins. And depending on the DSCAM protein that's been expressed on that neuron, that then affects the interactions a neuron can form with other neurons that are also expressing different variations of this DSCAM protein. So what you've got are thousands and thousands and thousands of different possible connections between neurons that are dictated by the presence of these different DSCAM isoforms. And these different possible connections are what allow formation of neural networks in the brain. Very interesting. The other role of DSCAM is in the innate immune system of the fly, where these different protein products function in a similar way to antibodies. So there's a variable region here that functions in a similar way to antibodies um, to grant the fly innate immunity to, to uh, pathogenic infection. So these different IgG repeats will recognize antigens that are present on um, invading pathogenic material to the fly. But like I say, if you want to read more about how the mechanics of this work, feel free. It's in the Molecular Biology of the Gene textbook. And um, you know that would come under the remit of extra reading, obviously. But you should know of the example. That's important. So that's alternative splicing. So we're almost ready now to get the mRNA out of the, out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm. We've generated a mature mRNA molecule now. It's got a cap, it's got a tail, it's been spliced. There's one other thing that can occur to mRNA in rare occasions before it gets exported into the cytoplasm and that's a situation or a phenomenon known as RNA editing. Now this generally occurs uh, by a process called deamination which the more, um, well those of you with a better memory may remember this phrase cropping up during the DNA damage lecture. So this is where you can get conversion of nucleotides to other nucleotides via, via a chemical event called deamination. And it's an example of how the mRNA sequence can actually be altered post-transcription. -trans 
yeah? So the best example, or one of the most common examples given for RNA editing, occurs um, in the polylipoprotein B mRNA, um, which can undergo RNA editing, and it undergoes RNA editing in a tissue-specific manner. So what happens is, depending on where the RNA is actually expressed, you end up with a different final protein product. And this protein product differs because of an RNA editing event prior to protein translation. So if the Apo uh, Apollo, uh, God, sorry, my pronunciation is terrible, terrible. If the Apollo, uh, apolipoprotein B mRNA is transcribed in the liver cells, then you don't get any RNA editing event occurring. The CAA nucleotide uh, codon here is not modified and you end up producing a full length Apo B protein called Apo B100. However, if the same mRNA is produced in the intestine, what tends to happen here is you get an RNA editing event occurring in the nucleus prior to mRNA export. This deamination event causes the deamination of a cytosine to a uracil. And as, a, as some of you may realise, UAA or TAA actually represents a termination codon sequence. So what happens during translation of this mRNA is that you actually translate a truncated protein, ApoB48, which obviously has a very different function to this one. And this is required because obviously the function of ApoB in the intestine differs to the function of ApoB in the liver with regards to the uh, role it's playing in, in, in fat uh, hydrolysis. So that's RNA editing, quite a rare event, but important you're aware of. So with the end of possible RNA editing events, we now get to the point of a, uh, mRNA nuclear export. And as I've mentioned numerous times throughout the degree, because this is a research area I used to work in, um, so I tend to bang on about it a little bit too much perhaps. But in eukaryotic cells, the transcriptional machinery is separate from the translational machinery. Therefore, there's a requirement to transport mRNA out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm prior to translation into protein. This entire complex is driven, in fact, by multiple RNA binding proteins interacting with the mRNA molecule, as we'll discuss now. Before we get on to the actual molecular biology of this, I just want to show you some old experiments, if you like, uh, which serve as a nice example of how observations made many years ago often go unexplained, and then eventually, because of our increased understanding in molecular mechanisms, we can offer an explanation for why scientists back in the 50s and 60s saw what they actually saw. And a nice example of this are the ex classic experiments done on the Balbiani rings of this um, particular fly, uh, C. tentans. I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce that. Carinumus sentens, I believe it is, but I may be wrong. So what this work on the Balbiani rings of this particular model uh, fly organism showed was that um, you were able to observe via microscopy the actual transcription and eventual export of mRNA molecules. So this is a loop from the genome of this particular fly. And what you're seeing here, these weird little shapes that are kind of emerging and decorating this uh, loop of DNA are actually the mRNA molecules that are being uh, transcribed by uh, RNA polymerase. So the first thing you notice is there's lots of mRNA being transcribed at the same time. This is how it actually works. You don't just get one RNA pole moving along and then finishing the job. You get multiple RNA polymerase is decorating a gene that's been expressed and all producing RNAs at the same time. Now, once an RNA is produced by RNA polymerase, it's very rapidly bound by RNA binding proteins. The reason for that is that RNAs need to be protected. We've already talked about how they're protected by the addition of a cap and a tail, but more than that, they need to be completely more or less coated by RNA binding proteins to prevent degradation prior to nuclear export and translation. So that's what these structures are here. These H and RMPs are heteronuclear ribonuclear proteins that bind to mRNA as it's been produced, decorate it and protect it from degradation. So this kind of little prone looking thing then is a mature mRNA that's been produced by this fly that's decorated in these uh, RNA binding proteins. Now what was interesting about this actual experiment was that you can see these large mRNA structures, these large mRNPs that are produced by this fly, you can actually follow these uh, mRNA molecules by electron microscopy and observe them as they exit the nucleus. And what the scientists saw, interestingly, was that these Balbiani rings mRNA molecules always exited the nuclear pore in the same direction. 
they always exited the nuclear port in a 5 prime to 3 prime manner. So in other words, the 5 prime end of the mRNA always came out first. And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. Because you want to make sure that everything's very efficient with regards to gene expression. So if you're having to export an mRNA through the nuclear pore complex of the nuclear membrane, as soon as the mRNA starts peaking out of that pore complex, ideally, you want ribosomes to be able to bind to it and start translating the mRNA sequence into protein. And obviously, the ribosomes can only do that if it's the 5' prime end of the mRNA, the bit with the start code on it, that comes out first. And that's what happens. The 5' prime end comes out first, ribosomes bind to it, and in fact we think that the binding of ribosomes and the process of translation may actually be important for ratcheting out the mRNA from the nucleus, for helping it to actually get pulled through the nuclear pore complex. So it all makes sense, this observation, but what's the molecular explanation for it? Why does 5' prime end always come out first? Why occasionally doesn't the 3' prime end go into the nuclear basket in the nuclear pore complex first and end up getting pulled through. Well, four or five years ago, a group from Harvard um, provided the molecular explanation for this in their work where they showed that the proteins that are responsible for actually directing export of mRNA out of the nucleus are a protein complex called TREX, the transcription and export complex. And this TREX complex, which is a series of um, 12, 13 proteins, are actually recruited exclusively to the 5' prime end of mRNA during splicing. So this TREX complex, the proteins that are actually needed to get the mRNA out of the nucleus, are exclusively recruited just at the 5' prime end of the mRNA. In fact, they're recruited via in virtue of interactions with the capping, CBC20, CBC80 capping complex. So this then gave us a really nice molecular explanation as to why Balbiani rings always go out 5' prime end first. And that explanation is that the actual proteins the mRNA needs to exit the nuclear pore are all located on the 5' prime end of the mRNA. In other words, the TREX complex is granting the mRNA polarity. Yeah, It's marking one end in particular for export first, the 5' prime end. So what happens once you recruit TREX to the 5' prime end of the mRNA is that the mRNA then moves towards a nuclear pore complex where it interacts with components within the nuclear pore complex called FG repeats or FG nuclear porins, these uh, repeats of proteins here, in such a way that it's kind of ratcheted through the nuclear pore. And the proteins which are known to interact with these FG repeats include the TREX proteins at the 5' prime end of the mRNA. So that's how we get mRNA out into the cytoplasm. We're going to talk about how it's translated and degraded, etc. more in the next lecture. So what I want to focus on now for the last couple of minutes is what happens when these processes go wrong. So let's think about situations where issues with the 5' prime cap can lead to disease. Well, most of the actual disease-related um, consequences for mutation of the cap relate to errors in translation. The cap's also very important in translation and initiation as we'll see in the next lecture. But there is a nice example of the cap being involved in disease with regards to influenza. So the influenza virus, as you may or may not know, actually replicates in the nucleus of infected cells, which for RNA viruses like influenza is very unusual. Because it replicates in the nucleus, it needs to hijack several of the cellular mechanisms in order to fully replicate its genome and eventually kill the cell and release more um, replic more infectious virus and during this virus replication process one of the things that the RNA uh, the virus actually needs to do is to produce mRNAs that the cell kind of recognizes as normal and to do that it actually snatches and steals caps from RNAs that the cell itself is producing so what we have here is we have a viral RNA being produced that lacks a cap so under normal circumstances, this viral RNA will get degraded by the exonucleases that are present in the nucleus. These exonucleases are present just for that reason, to degrade foreign RNA that may be pathogenic. But what influenza does is it uses one or two proteins it expresses, which are capable of snatching the cap complex from host mRNAs. So these caps are snipped off and then tagged on to the actual viral RNAs to create what's called a chimeric influenza mRNA which contains 
influenza mRNA sequence, but it's kind of like masquerading as a cellular RNA by virtue of the presence of this five prime cellular cap. We've just seen how important the cap is in recruiting the proteins required for export, etc. So once influenza gets hold of this cap, it can then mimic um, a cellular mRNA the Trex complex and the other proteins required for export are recruited as normal and the viral RNA can get out into the cytoplasm where it's where the translation machine will make more uh, influenza proteins. So it's a really nice uh, mechanism that influenza has evolved for ensuring that replication is very efficient during the infectious, infectious cycle. Errors in the poly A tail are relatively common. Examples of mutations. Um, one that I want to give you is an example of a mutation in the poly A signal region of a protein called acetyl transferase 1. And this mutation has been directly linked to uh, specific types of colorectal cancer. And then splicing. Well, splicing, as I alluded to earlier on, actually is a really important uh, contributor to human disease and uh, mutation and human disease. It's estimated that actually around 20% of all mutations that cause disease are affecting pre-mRNA splicing. And that's probably not that surprising if you think of how prevalent alternative splicing is in higher organisms. So these mutations tend to be either cis or trans in nature. So in other words, they tend to be either direct or indirect in nature. So for example, you can get mutations in the exonic splicing enhancer regions. And this is obviously going to affect how the alternative splicing occurs for an mRNA. If you mutate the exonic splicing enhancer, you may end up with an exon being removed by mistake. And in fact, alternative splice sites and errors in exonic splicing enhancers um, are good examples of mutations that lead to a range of diseases, including, including Fraser syndrome, which, which affects the womb's tumour protein, and also several types of mutations that lead to mild variants of cystic fibrosis. There are other mutations which actually occur in the spliceosomal core components themselves, uh, which can lead to different types of diseases such as retinitis pigmentosa. And also there are certain different splice variants of proteins which can give rise to cancer. I'm sure if you do some extra reading you'll be able to find lots of other examples of errors in splicing which can lead to disease. There are also a number of diseases which have been identified that arise due to uh, an inability to correctly export mRNA. There are several mutations that give rise to myotonic dystrophy type 1, which is a type of um, myotonic dystrophy that arises due to mutated versions of um, dystrophin mRNA. And what happens is that these mutated mRNAs from the dystrophin gene are retained in the nucleus and then start affecting how other splice variants of dystrophin are produced. There are also rare diseases which are linked to mutations in genes which produce proteins that are involved in releasing mRNA from the nuclear pore complex. So the protein GLE1, GLE1, is essential for the mRNA to be released from the nuclear pore complex at the end of mRNA export. And if you mutate the GLE1 gene, it can lead to a rare type of disorder called lethal congenital contracture syndrome 1. So a rare syndrome, but another example of how human disease can directly arise from errors in these key molecular proteins. So the take-home message then, just to finish with, 5' prime and 3' prime processing, capping and polydenylation of an mRNA, it's about stability. It's about making sure that that mRNA is stable and not degraded. Splicing, removal of the introns, obviously important for correct translation into protein, but really alternative splicing from our point of view is key. The ability to produce many different protein isoforms from a single gene is what makes us human. A nuclear export, it's about efficient transport of the mRNA into the cytoplasm. It always occurs in the 5' prime to 3' prime manner. The reason for that, we now understand, is because the human Trex complex is recruited exclusively to the 5' prime end of the mRNA, and it's the Trex complex which actually does the business of exporting the mRNA through the nuclear pore. So I hope that's been helpful. As a podcast, I would again really like to load the chapter on uh, RNA splicing and um, post-transcriptional modification that exists in molecular biology of the gene. It's a really great chapter and it goes into a lot more detail than I have time to in this lecture. So thank you. Look out for more lectures in the uh, module appearing on, on this YouTube channel. Cheers.